Colossians chapter 3. I would like to read the first two verses. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And I would just like to entitle this lesson this morning, Looking Up in Love. Looking Up in Love. You may be seated. Notice that we have a picture here in Colossians chapter 3 of Christ exalted, sitting at the right hand of God. Now that phrase shouldn't disturb us who believe in the one true God. Because we know that God is a spirit. He fills the universe. He's omnipresent or everywhere present. And we can't conceive of the spirit having a right hand apart from some manifestation or incarnation. And so when the Bible says that Christ sits on the right hand of God, we don't think of him as perched upon some gigantic hand somewhere. Nor do we even think of uh, one throne sitting next to another throne, because the book of Revelation tells us there is only one throne, chapter 4 and verse 2. But rather we understand that something much more profound is going on than trying to tell us the bodily position of persons who's in the Godhead for thousands of years. What actually is going on is telling us who Jesus is. That man, Jesus Christ, was more than just a man. While he walked on earth, he had the appearance of every other man. Perhaps the casual passerby would have uh, just glanced at him and not seen anything particularly out of the ordinary. But those who looked with the eyes of faith soon perceived that there was more to Jesus than just that. And today, Jesus, having died for our sins, been buried, been resurrected the third day, he no longer appears among us simply as an ordinary man, as a mortal man. No, Jesus Christ is not walking this earth in a physical form as he did uh, in the days of his, his earthly life. Nor is Jesus Christ dead, lying in a grave somewhere, as all other men from that time are. But rather, Jesus Christ has been resurrected. He has been exalted. He has been glorified. He's been given an immortal body. Hallelujah. And so if we were to see Jesus now, we would respond as Stephen, I see God, the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. In other words, I don't merely see Jesus as he walks on this earth, but I see him enveloped in the very glory of the invisible, eternal Spirit of God. We would react as John reacted in Revelation chapter 1. He heard the sound of the voice and he turned. John was the disciple whom Jesus loved, had been with him on numerous occasions, leaned up against him at the Last Supper. But this time, when John turned and looked at him, there was a difference. He fell at his feet as if he were dead. Why so, John? You knew him personally. You knew him very well. What would surprise you or shock you or so overwhelm you with awe that you would fall down as if you were dead? It's because he did not see Jesus merely as the ordinary mortal who lived among men. But he saw him glorified. He saw him exalted with all power and authority. He saw Jesus on the right hand of God. You see, the right hand represents power. In ancient cultures, in Hebrew, in Greek, even in modern English, the term right hand signifies a position of influence, of power, of authority. And if you go back to the Old Testament, use a simple concordance and look up every time the term right hand is used. Perhaps a few times it refers to someone's literal right hand. But most of the time it refers to a position of power, a position of authority. In fact, you go back, for example, to Exodus 15 and 6. After God delivered the Israelites from uh, the Red Sea and caused their enemies to be destroyed, the Israelites sang a song of praise. And notice what they said. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. No one expects that some gigantic form stalked out over the Red Sea with one hand tied behind his back but with his right hand scooping up the enemies. But rather we understand, Thy right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. 
You have conquered. You have been victorious. You are magnificent. You are powerful. You are the Savior. And so in the New Testament, when the Bible says that Jesus is on the right hand of God, we are to understand Jesus is no mere man. Yes, He is a man, but He's more than just a man. He is the power of God. He is the authority of God. He is the salvation of God. He is the glory of God. He is that magnificence of God revealed to us. Praise God. Well, I'm not going to teach on the oneness of God today. That's just kind of a foundation to let you know that I know what the Scripture is talking about when it says that Jesus is on the right hand of God. But the point that I'm trying to get at is this. If we are risen with Christ, if we have identified with His death by repenting of our sins, dying to the old way of life, if we have been buried with Him by water baptism in His name, if we have been filled with His Spirit and so participate in that resurrection life, if we are truly alive with Christ, then we need to realize who Christ is and where Christ is. Christ is not just walking around this earth bound to the limitations of this life. Christ is not concerned with the mundane activities that sometimes preoccupy us. He is not worried about social status. He is not worried about what kind of car to drive. He's not concerned about the latest fashion of clothing. He's not really concerned about what other people think of Him. If we are identified with Jesus Christ, if He is our Lord, if we are participating in new life in Christ, then we ought to realize where Christ is. He is exalted. He is glorified. He is in heaven. He transcends this world. He is not bound by the limitations of space and time. He is not limited by human thinking. He is not limited by the sufferings of the flesh. But He is forever glorified. He inhabits eternity. He lives in heaven. He is preparing a place for us. And that's who we should identify with in our lives. If our Lord, Christ, if the source of our life, Christ, is exalted and glorified and reigns in glory, then we should not be so concerned about the details of this life. Set your affection on things above. Don't fall in love with the things of this earth. Don't allow your mind to be preoccupied, obsessed, troubled with the problems of this life. Because your Lord is not bound to this fear. When it seems that the problems of the world get you down, when it seems that the allurements of this life are so enticing and so persuasive, look up. Realize that you are part of the body of Christ and your head has transcended this earthly realm. Jesus Christ, your King, your Lord, your Savior is reigning in glory. So why do you look down? Why are you discouraged? Why are you troubled by the problems at hand? Why are you consumed by the trials of life? Why are you so enticed by the temptations of this world? After all, the source of your life the source of your spiritual existence. Your Almighty Lord is not looking down. He is not down here. He is not bound. He is not limited. He is not tempted by the devil. But He reigns in glory. He rules from heaven. So why don't you look up and draw your inspiration and direction from Him? Don't look down. Don't look around. Don't be so preoccupied by the circumstances that surround you that you cannot see the victory that God has for you. Don't be so involved in the details that you see to the right hand or to the left or even in front of you the seemingly insurmountable barriers that would prevent you from doing the perfect will of God. But in times like that, when circumstances seem to surround you, look up to Jesus Christ. Praise God. Keep your eyes on the things which are above. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Praise God. What I'm saying here this morning is we have a heavenly hope. We have a heavenly hope. We are not limited to this world as other people are. But we have a hope beyond this life. And so what should motivate us in the decisions of our daily life are not the ends or the goals of this life. But what should motivate us are the things which are beyond and above this life. The glory that Jesus Christ now is enveloped. The glory in which we shall participate. That should motivate us in our life down here on earth. We have a heavenly hope. If you turn back to 
Colossians chapter 1. Notice how Paul addresses the church in Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 through verse 5. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Now, what is motivating the Colossians to live for God? What is motivating them to have faith in Christ Jesus and to have love for all the saints? It says in verse 5, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. We have a heavenly hope. There is a hope that awaits us. There's something more than this life has to offer. Even as we rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit and feel the righteousness, joy, and peace that comes from the indwelling presence of God, still, that is not all there is. This is only a foretaste, the Bible tells us. This is only the first fruits, the initial fruit of the harvest that gets ripe early before the main harvest. This is simply the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance. This is not the fullness that God has to offer. What we enjoy right here today is simply a little bit of the kingdom of heaven touching down upon earth. But we have something even greater than this that awaits us. We have a heavenly hope. We have the promise of eternal life. We have the hope of living with our Lord for eternity. Praise God. We have a heavenly hope. And that hope should motivate us to live for the Lord right now. How is that hope so certain and so sure? Verse 27 tells us, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery of, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, when I say we have a heavenly hope, it's not merely wishful thinking. It's not merely as some people would accuse us, we believe in pie in the sky by and by. And we've got such a fond fantasy that we don't really uh, do anything down here. We're not really of any practical use because we're just living in a dream world. That's not what I mean when I say a hope. When you use the word hope in reference to other things in life, perhaps sometimes hopes are unrealistic. Perhaps sometimes hopes can be mere wishes or fantasies unrelated to what is likely to occur. But when I say we have a heavenly hope, I don't mean to imply any uncertainty whatsoever. Although many other religions have various schemes for the future, various hopes of salvation or heaven or bliss or whatever it may be, and in many cases it is very unrealistic, in many cases, it will never come to pass the way they imagine. But there is a difference with us. It's not merely a doctrine. It's not merely a theology. It's not merely something we read in a book. It's not merely something we dreamed up that sounds really good that, that we would like to come to pass. But what makes our hope very real and very tangible, going beyond philosophy, going beyond theology, going beyond psychology, and coming into the realm of the very practical and the certain, is because we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. We have a certain hope because we receive the Spirit of the living God. And the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We can point to a time and a place where we repented of sin. We can point to a time and a place where God filled us with His Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the resurrected Christ. It's not merely theory. It's practicality. We know what happened to us. We heard ourselves speak in a language that we did not know. We felt the presence of God that we had never felt before in our lives. We saw the miracle working power of God personally. No one can tell me that I did not receive it. No one can tell me that I cannot feel it because I know by personal experience confirmed by the Word of God that Jesus Christ is alive and well. My Lord reigns in glory. And not only that, He fills my soul today. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We ought to be able 
the Apostle Peter said, to give an answer to everyone that asks us about the reason for the hope that lies within us. I think we ought to have a good biblical response. But along with that biblical response, there's nothing that can take the place of a personal testimony. They can argue with your theology. But what can they say when you say, Jesus Christ changed my life? Jesus Christ delivered me from sin. I can feel Him right now. I know what happened to me. It's real. It's real. I know it's real. Praise God. The most powerful testimony is the personal testimony backed up by the Word of God. It's when you show someone what the Bible says, and then you say, I receive what the Bible says. A couple months ago, I had the interesting opportunity of having a debate with a Muslim on whether the Bible or the Quran is the Word of God. It's in Houston, Texas. Quite a group of our people came, and a number of the Muslims came. And so I begin to present our views and why we believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. And, of course, I talked about history. I talked about prophecy. I talked about archaeology. I talked about what Jesus said and what the apostles testified to and the prophets testified to. Well, the Muslims claim all the same thing. They go back to history and archaeology and what Muhammad had to say and all this kind of stuff. And so you might, just an observer, a neutral person, an atheist, might say, well, the arguments were evenly matched. However... That was only the beginning of what I could say about the Bible. What I got down to finally was everything the Bible promises comes true. And there are promises in the Bible. There are experiences recorded in Scripture that I have personally seen in my life. What is recorded almost 2,000 years ago about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, I can verify that that part of the Bible is true because it's still happening today. When the Bible promises divine healing, I can verify that part of the Bible is true because I've seen divine healing. And on and on we go. And so in the parts of the Bible that we aren't able to test by uh, physical means, like the promise of heaven and so on, there's no way that we can test that down here. But if everything we can test proves true, if every promise that's for us, we can receive. If every experience that's recorded for humanity today, we can experience. If we can verify the truth of the Bible in every point that affects us in this life, then that gives us confidence that the rest of the Bible is also going to prove to be true. Well, in response to that, Muslim, well, he just gave a, a list of things where the Bible was wrong and had mistakes and all this kind of stuff which was rather easy to refute. And then it was my job to close it all out. And I said, you know what has struck me? The key difference between what we presented here today. We both presented all kinds of historical evidence and evidence from prophets and this and that and the other about our respective books. But the difference is this. The Bible invites you to prove that it's true today by personal experience confirming the Word. The Quran and Islam has nothing to offer in that regard. Islam says, believe this book, but that's all they're able to say. But I say, believe this book, try it, find out it's real in your own life. If you're bound by sin, look to Jesus according to the Word of God, the Bible, and you can find deliverance. If you need peace of mind, if you need the joy of the Lord, whatever you need in your life, you can go to the Bible. You can find a verse that applies to your need. You can pray. You can ask God to fulfill it. And you can prove it true in your own life. The Bible still works today. We have a heavenly hope. But that hope is not just in, hidden in the midst of heaven or fantasy, but it's very real and present. When Jesus Christ intervenes in our own lives, we have Christ in you, the hope of glory. Praise God. Praise God. So our experience with the Lord personally, right here and right now, ought to convince us there's something to this. It ought to convince us that the Lord is intervening in this world, but He is not limited to this world. Your Lord reigns in glory. If you have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within you now, that ought to tell you that Christ is not merely a man hanging on a crucifix, that Christ is not merely a dead body in a tomb, that Christ is not merely a fond memory. He's not merely a martyr for truth. He's not merely a prophet that told people good things. He's not merely a teacher that showed us a better way. He may be a of that, but He's much more than that because the Spirit of the living Christ is now dwelling in our hearts. That ought to convince us there's a sure and certain hope that Christ is alive and well. He's 
conquered death. He's conquered sin. He's conquered the devil. He's not bound to this earth, but he rules from heaven. He reigns in glory. That's our hope. And our hope is a certain hope, a sure hope. And so, every time you feel the presence of God, that ought to remind you, I'm not limited to this world. Look up. You ought to realize the source of this power is not from somebody around here. The source of this blessing, this joy, this experience is not from this earth, but it's from the other world. It's from the heavenly world. Jesus Christ lives forever. He's the one that's working in my life. He reigns from heaven. Look up. Fall in love with Him. Keep your affections upon Him. Set your mind upon Him. And you'll find it makes all the difference in the world in living for God right here and right now. We have a heavenly hope. And the assurance of that hope of glory comes by the indwelling Christ who is with us even now. Praise God. Praise God. Notice in Colossians 1 here that we've just read, the Apostle Paul made reference in verse 4 to the faith of the saints. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. And if you let me skip to verse 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Notice what's happening. Because you have this hope in heaven, you are able to have faith in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what it's saying? We've heard of your faith that you have for the hope. And, and then he goes on to say, which you heard uh, before in the word of the truth of the gospel. So evidently what he's saying is, you heard the gospel preached to you. The word of truth came to you. That instilled a hope in your heart. As you heard the word being preached, your mind began to think, maybe there is a hope beyond this life. As you heard the gospel preached, your, your eyes begin to look up into the invisible heaven. And you thought, yes, there is a hope for me. There is hope. And that hope has motivated you to put your faith in Jesus Christ and to secure your salvation. He says, I thank God for the faith that you have, which has been motivated by the hope. Now, what I'm saying for us today, if we have a heavenly hope, and we do, if we have the indwelling Christ as the hope of glory, which we do, then that heavenly hope ought to motivate us to trust in God every day. That heavenly hope ought to motivate us to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you realize that the Lord has conquered this world, that the Lord is truly the Lord of this world, that the Lord sits on the right hand of God, you may think of God or you may have thought of God as a million miles away, unapproachable, transcendent, far beyond our comprehension. But when you realize that Christ has personified God to us, that Christ is on the right hand of God, that in Christ is invested the very glory of the unapproachable God, so that the unapproachable, invisible God has become approachable and visible and tangible in our own lives, then that ought to encourage us to put our faith in that true God. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in Him. Rely upon Him. Depend upon Him. Our heavenly hope motivates us to have faith right now. And so as you go about your daily life and you face the inevitable frustrations, difficulties, problems, discouragements, things don't seem to work out the way you thought they would or should, it seems like things go wrong when they're supposed to go right, it seems like when you take a stand for truth that you are punished because of it or you suffer because of it, it seems like the more you try to do the will of God, the more the devil attacks you. It could be easy to be discouraged in situations like that. But I want you to think about it. Do you have a heavenly hope? Do you really believe there's a Lord who reigns in heaven that's not limited to this world? Do you really believe that you have the spirit of that living Lord in your heart right now? Can you feel that? Do you know it's true? Well, if you have that sure and certain hope, it ought to motivate you to walk by faith right now. Because you realize this life is not the end of the story. This life is not all there is to it. Even if you suffer trials from now until the day you die or until the Lord comes for His church still, you ought to realize that you be victorious in the end because you're living for God. You've got a Lord who's above and beyond this world. And if you have to go through the rest of the li of your life struggling and, and uh, fighting still, the victory is yours because your Lord reigns in heaven. Look up. 
and see your Lord. And that ought to mot- motivate you to have faith right now. Praise God. Look up. You can't see Him with your physical eyes, but you can feel His presence. There are many ways you can know He's real, that you can know He's in control, that you can know He's glorified. And that ought to give us confidence right now. That ought to make us trust in Him right now. If we know that He's made it, if we know that He's in control, if we know that He's looking down upon us from His heavenly throne, then that ought to encourage us to put our lives into His hands. Not just the one time when we were born again, but every day to put that day into the hands of the Lord. Every day to put our faith in Him. Every day to trust Him to help us through. To trust Him to give us victory. To trust Him to make a way where there seems to be no way. Our heavenly hope motivates us to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. And then, notice, still in Colossians 1 and 4, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, our hope also motivates us to have love for one another. That's what it's saying. The Apostle Paul says, I give thanks not only for the faith, but I give thanks for the love that you have for the other believers, for the hope that is laid up for you. You have love because of that heavenly hope. Our hope of eternity, our hope, our heavenly hope ought to motivate us to love one another right here and right now. It's not an impractical pie in the sky. After all, it's a very practical hope that affects the conduct of our life right here and right now. You see, if you really believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He's Lord of all, that there is only one Lord after all, one Lord for Jew and Gentile, one Lord for black and white, one Lord for all humankind, if you really believe that, and if you furthermore believe that one day you are going to meet the Lord in the judgment with everyone else and give an account. And if you really believe that one day that you are going to rule and reign with Christ, that you are going to gather around the throne with the saints of all the ages from every tongue, kindred, nation, and tribe, as the book of Revelation says, and you're going to worship God together, and that's going to be the most glorious experience you can ever imagine. That's the hope of the Christian, eternity with the Lord and with all the saints. If that's really your hope, if that's really what you long for, if that's really what you believe in, if that's what keeps you going every day, then that ought to make you think about how we should act right here and right now. If I expect and if I desire and long for the privilege of being able to worship God in heaven with my brothers and sisters who are here, then what makes me think that I can avoid loving them right now? If my hope is to live with them for eternity in the presence of God, then I ought to start working on living with them right here and right now. If my joy of eternity is to worship God with all the saints, how come I can't worship God with all the saints right here? See, that's what I can understand about some that feel like certain classes or races of people should be excluded from a certain congregation. If you expect to worship God with every nation, tongue, kindred, and tribe in heaven, you better start working on it down here. If you can't do that down here, what makes you think you're going to be up there? If you hate doing that down here, what makes you think you would like to be in heaven or that God would like for you to be in heaven? Our heavenly hope ought to motivate us to love one another down here. You know, we shout about heaven. How beautiful it will be. Won't it be wonderful there? Won't we have a time? Well, think what heaven's going to be like. If you hate the fact that Standing next to you is someone who's black or someone who speaks Spanish or someone who's this, that, the other, someone who's poorly dressed, then you won't enjoy heaven because you're going to find that person there in heaven worshiping right next to you. You better get used to it down here. You better pray through until you can not only tolerate it, but appreciate it and enjoy it and love one another. Praise God. Our heavenly hope ought to motivate us to love one another. And if it cuts against our tradition or our training or our culture, we need to pray until we can see people like God sees people. Until we can have a love for them like God has a love for them. 
Praise God. You see, I know there are problems in society. I know there's prejudice sometimes both ways in our society. I know there are arguments. You can argue, well, these people shouldn't be here, or that person shouldn't be here, or this group is causing trouble, and that's this, that, and the other. But those are arguments related to down here. That should have no effect on what we believe when a person is born again. That should really have no effect on our evangelism. Whether a person seems worthy or not is beside the point. Whether a person seems to have caused trouble or not is beside the point. Whether somebody has a right to be here, you know, the, the, uh, the American Indians would have the best argument of all. They could say all the rest of us have no right to be here. You see? But the proper way to look at it is forget about the injustices of the past. Forget about the rights and wrongs as far as culture and race and all that. Is this person a human being? Is this person a soul for whom Jesus died? Then we've got to reach them. Wherever they are, whoever they are, it doesn't matter the right and wrong. They deserve to hear the gospel. They need an opportunity to be saved. And once they are saved, they need to be treated as a brother or a sister in Christ. Praise God. I don't know if this makes anybody mad or not, but it seems to me the Scripture says if you have a hope of heaven... It ought to encourage you and motivate you and propel you to show Christian love for one another right here and right now. What good is your hope of heaven if it doesn't make you any different right now? What good is it to say Jesus is my Lord if you don't obey Him right now? You expect in heaven to suddenly start obeying Him? I don't believe that's going to be the way it works. You need to look up right now and start getting your orders from the Lord right now. Don't take your orders from this world. Don't take your orders from the politicians. Don't take your orders from the rebels that would seek to divide our society. Don't take your orders from the traditional minded that maybe don't appreciate people. But take your orders from the living Lord. Why don't you look up? And when you look up, that hope will motivate you to love people right here and right now. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. I'm not just talking about race and class divisions either. You can very easily look across the church and see somebody whose personality rubs you the wrong way. Sometimes that does happen. Or somebody that's done you wrong. Or at least you think they've done you wrong. But in most cases... Isn't that really the way it is? We're right and the other person's wrong. That's almost always the way it is. Very seldom are we wrong. You know, if we are just willing to um, be reconciled when we realize we're wrong, there will be very few reconciliations, wouldn't there? We've got to somehow become humble enough to offer reconciliation even when we think we're right and the other person's wrong. Because really, that's about the only time that reconciliation is going to occur. But, you know, if you hold out that olive branch of peace, you'll find in most cases the person will respond in kind. The situation is waiting for someone to take the humble road and say, I'm sorry, forgive me. You say, well, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, something happened. Something has caused confusion or trouble. And you can be honest enough to say, whatever I've contributed to this situation, I'm genuinely sorry for it. If it's misunderstanding, if it's misreading, if, if I didn't handle it right, to whatever extent that I'm responsible for it, I want to make it right. Why? Why is it so important to seek reconciliation? Jesus said, if you come to your alt- into altar, Matthew chapter 5, and you want to give a gift to God, you come to the altar. You come to worship. You come to sacrifice. You come to offer a gift. You look up at your Lord. When you look up, that ought to reorient your perspective. Wait a minute. There's one Lord, and we're all supposed to be brothers under that one Lord. And I remember that my brother has something against me. It didn't say that I have something against my brother. It says, if if you remember... That your brother has something against you. And it doesn't say he legitimately had something. It just says he has a feeling toward you for whatever reason. Well, Jesus said first, leave your gift at the altar. Go be reconciled to your brother to the extent that you're capable, of course. You can't dictate how people respond to you. But you can control how you act towards people. And I read from Romans 12 uh, the other day, yesterday, that as far as lieth within you, Live in peace with all men. As far as your side is concerned, you can have an open channel of communication. If they refuse to communicate, it's no longer your problem. It's their problem. It's between them and God. But you go search them out. Don't wait for them to come apologize after recognizing that they're the ones that are wrong. 
But you go to them and you offer the reconciliation. Be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift to God. Then, when you know that you've done everything in your power to be friends, when you've done everything you can to apologize or to remedy any wrong that you may have done, then you can come back with a clear conscience, look up again and say, Lord, I'm serving you. Lord, I love you. And you can do it with all sincerity. Our heavenly hope should motivate us to love one another down here. Praise God. Look up. Fall in love with Jesus Christ. Participate in the love that He has for everyone in the church. And indeed for all mankind. And then let that love start flowing through you. Our heavenly hope motivates us to have faith in Jesus every day. Our heavenly hope also motivates us to love one another down here. Praise the Lord. Let me go back to chapter 3 of Colossians. And let me read the first four verses. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. Now, This is telling us, look, your very source of existence is Jesus Christ. He is your life. He is your Lord. He is your soon coming King. He is the one who reigns in glory. When you look upon Him, then the things of this world should recede into insignificance. Your loves should be the things that He loves. Your mind should be set on the things that He cares about. You shouldn't place undue significance on the things of this world that are temporary and that will pass away. But you should place your mind on the heavenly values. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for you're dead. You see, as far as this world is concerned, we should be as dead people. If somebody came up to a dead person, man lying in a casket and waved a million dollars in his face and said, I'll give you this if you'll just do what I say. There'll be no reaction, right? He's dead. We need to be dead to sin in the same manner. We need to be dead to temptation. Our life is not down here. Our life is up there. The source of our life is not down here. The source of our life is the Lord who lives and reigns in glory. And so, therefore, we should not react to temptations that come from down here. We should not react to earthly motivations, but we should react to heavenly motivations. We are dead, and our life is hid with Christ in God. Our true life is not this outward life. Our true life is hidden with Christ. Where do we get... This, our joy, not from down here. We get it from that hidden realm, from Jesus Christ. Oh, I know there are joyful things in life, but what if things go wrong in life? The Christian still has joy, joy in the Holy Spirit. See, the source of our joy is not down here. Rather, we have joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's not earthly joy. That's heavenly joy. Our true life is hid with Christ in God. Our peace is not based upon the circumstances of this life, but we have the peace which passes understanding. Jesus said, I give you peace, not as the world gives you, but I give you peace that the world cannot give you. Our true life is hid with Christ in God. The source of our existence, the source of our joy, the source of our peace is not from down here, but it's from up there. It's from Christ. So why don't you look up? And recognize where your true life is. Now, when the people of this world look at you, they don't understand the real life. They may sometimes evaluate us if you have an unsaved loved one or friend. And they may think, why do you go to church every week? I mean, Christmas and Easter would be sufficient. And not merely once a week, but two, three, four, five times a week. I mean, take a vacation to go to church all week long. Morning, noon, and night. That does not make sense. 
to the people of this world. And then not only that, the days you don't have church, you insist on praying first thing in the morning or last thing at night or maybe both or in between. Just doesn't add up. They don't see the joy. And, and you mean you, you don't do this? I mean, you're not going to catch the latest movie? I mean, you don't even have a TV? You know what? You know what's so funny to me? When I was living in St. Louis... We were living in a relatively new subdivision. And every couple months, somebody would come by from the cable company. Then I moved to Austin. And no, we hadn't been moved in very long. Somebody comes from the cable company. And two nicely dressed men come with a, a shirt and a tie, white shirt and a tie. They come to the front door. And we're from such and such and such cable television company. And we would like to tell you about our latest offer. And they start going off in their spiel. It's so hard to inject anything. So I listen for a few moments. And then I say, well... Wait for just the right time, you know. Got their full attention. Well, I don't think I'll be interested because um, I don't have a television. And you can just see the shock on their face. What did you say? You don't what? I, said, I don't have a television, so therefore I don't think I would be interested in you putting a cable in my home. And after they recover from that a while, the reactions are very interesting. Like, well, well what do you do all day? <laughs> so I've got plenty to do. <laughs> what, I, what I wouldn't know what to do is if I had one. I mean, my time is taken already. And then he says, <laughs> and one guy says, do you read a lot of books or what? <laughs> I said, well, I do read quite a bit, but I do a lot of other things too. He says, well, we got, and he says, well, why, can I ask you? He says, now, this is my business, so I'm very interested to know. Can I ask you why you do not have a television? I said, well, because really there's not hardly anything on there that's really worth watching. And he says, well, well if, if you would let us put a cable in, there, there's all kinds of stuff on there. That, you know, there's lots of stuff that would be interesting. Well, it's all about the same kind of thing. So they walk away, probably the first time in their lives that they've ever had an interview like that. I enjoy that. It's not embarrassing to me at all. It's enjoyable to me because it blows their mind. They can't understand it. Now, maybe that can be a witness to them. Who knows? It has been. I remember, uh, well, it's more than once. Unsaved neighbor or unsaved friend come and, you know, the first thing knows is, where's your TV? Oh, we don't have a. You don't have a TV? No, we just feel in our family that it just causes more trouble than it would good. And as far as our kids are concerned, we, you know, it's just too hard to try to keep track of that. And we'd just rather not even have it, not even worry about it. And then sometimes they say, you know, that's right. You know, they don't have the strength to, to do it in their own lives, but often they'll They'll say, and sincerely say, you know, that's right. So it sometimes is a witness. But I don't really expect the unsaved to fully comprehend it. You know, I don't try to, try to convert them on that basis because I don't expect them to understand the way of holiness. You know, when all they can see is we're missing out on joy. They don't understand that we've got joy that they don't know anything about. See? All they can see is we're taking all our time coming to church. They don't comprehend the glory that we experience when we're in church. See, all they can see is the external, and it seems strange to them. But when you get those kind of strange reactions, it shouldn't bother you in the least. Realize your true life is hid with Christ in God. You can't really expect the carnal mind to see what's going on in your life. You can't expect them to understand the real life. Hey, we're enjoying the abundant life right here and now. Not even to speak of the eternal life that awaits us. So don't measure your life by the people of this world. Your true life is hid with Christ in God. Don't look around to get your direction for life. Don't look at your unsaved friends and loved ones and neighbors to figure out how to live. Look up and get your direction from the risen Christ. Let Him tell you how to live. That's the source of your true life. Praise God. What I'm saying here, and what I think these verses in Colossians 3 are saying, our heavenly hope motivates us to holiness. Our heavenly hope motivates us to holiness. When people really fall in love with Jesus Christ, the teachings of holiness are not really a problem. And I really believe that. It's when people start looking around too much, when people start looking down, when people start focusing on the various little hopes that they have in this life, 
That's when the Christian lifestyle seems to be a little too restrictive or a little too burdensome. But when they look up to Jesus Christ, that the glory He shares with us, the eternal glory that awaits us, then we can truly say that the Lord's yoke is easy and His burden is light. It's the burden of sin that's so heavy, but the Lord's burden is not heavy at all. It's very light. It's very easy. It's a joy to serve God. It's a joy to live for Him. It's a privilege to be the child of the King, to walk in the high way of holiness. It's not a low route. It's the high way of holiness. And our heavenly hope motivates us to live for God right now. Praise God. If we didn't have a heavenly hope, we would say, well, let's try to maximize the joy that we can get in this life. Let's find those pleasures of sin. There are pleasures of sin, but they're only for a season. And so if our vision is limited to that season, then we might well choose the pleasures of sin. But when our vision is unlimited, when we look into eternity, then we see how foolish and trivial and temporary and transient indeed are the pleasures of sin. They're only tinsel. They're not pure gold. And so when we look up, when we look to Jesus, when we look to heaven, when we look to glory, then it's easy for us to walk in the way of holiness. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. When temptation strikes, when your wonder is really this or that necessary, when you wonder, well, indulging in this little thing or that little thing, what real harm could it do? When you start thinking like that, look up. Look to Jesus. Ask Him about it. Ask Him if eternity is going to be worth it or not. And then make your decision. Praise God. Make it on heavenly values. As I was teaching a couple days ago from Romans chapter 12, we need to live by heavenly values. Our lifestyle should be molded by what's going to matter a hundred years from now, not what's going to matter tomorrow. Our lifestyle should be molded upon what the Lord thinks not what people think. Our love should be based on what the Lord loves, not what the world loves. First John chapter 2, verse 15 through verse 17 gives us a good understanding of this. Love not the world. That's not talking about people. We are to love the people of the world. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. In that context, it's talking about people. We are to love the sinner. But here, love not the world. He's talking about the value system of the world, the thinking of the world, the lifestyle of the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. In a spiritual sense, we can say, I love God. I love my wife. I love my children. I love the truth. I love the church. But in a spiritual sense, we shouldn't really say, I love my car. I love my house. I love spaghetti. It should be, I like those things. Now, I'm not trying to be technical or picky, but I'm saying in our thinking, there should be no comparison. When we say, oh, what a beautiful car. I've been wanting this for years. We need to realize, look, it's just a set of wheels to get me where I'm going. It really doesn't matter after all. I mean, you may think you're in love with that. But if you had a car wreck, which would you be concerned about? Whether your little child is killed or whether your car's messed up. So it is with heavenly things. We shouldn't love our job or love pleasures or love money or love anything really compared with our love for God. What really counts? If there's a spiritual smash up what's really important are you holding on to god is your hope of heaven still secure you can lose everything else but you don't want to lose your heavenly hope you can lose friendship you can even lose loved ones you can lose a job you can lose other things because of your stand for the lord but never let your like for these things compare to your love for the lord that must come first keep looking up when trials come when disaster strikes Don't look down. Don't look around. Keep looking up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't love the things of this world. For all... Well, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't serve two masters, Jesus said. No one can do that. And so if you're not looking up 
in following direction from the Lord. Or let me put it this way. If you're following the direction of this world, then you can't be looking up at the same time. You can't be looking around and following the things of this world and looking up at the same time. It's one or the other. And if you have a love for this world, then you really don't have the love of God. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the strong desire of the flesh, it may be a desire for immorality, it may be a desire for money, a desire for power, any strong motivating force of the flesh that would come against the will of God in your life. The lust of the eyes, the temptation, the strong desire that attacks us through our primary sensory gate, which is the eye. It could be greed when you see things around you. It could be immorality. It could be like Achan who saw the Babylonian wealth and he said, I saw it and I took it. It could be immoral action like David who saw Bathsheba and that motivated him to adultery and to murder in an attempt to cover up his adultery. The lust of the eyes. By the way, that's why I don't have a television in my home because that's how Satan can really attack through the eyes. And the pride of life, the ego, the self-will, that motivates a lot, doesn't it? You know, yeah, I know the church believes this and the pastor teaches this and the Bible says this and maybe in general that's okay for most people. And I've actually heard people say this. But in my case, I can handle it. Because I know other people can't. I, I don't mean just to harp on television, but I, I just got thought of that. There was a man in a church. The pastor asked me to teach on the lust of the eyes, apply to television and so on. This man was a prominent man in the church, but he told the pastor, he says, well, you know, that's good teaching, and most people need that teaching, but he says, I can handle it. He had a television in his home. He says, most people can't handle it, but I can handle it. Well, to me, I don't know the man's heart, but from what he said, it seems to me like that's the pride of life. You know what I mean? That's the ego saying, I'm different. I don't, I don't have to go by the rules. You know, I'm, I'm an old-time saint. I'm a preacher. I'm this. I'm that. The rules don't apply to me. Yeah, I know in general we should tell the truth, but in this case, I think I can tell a lie and get around everything and work out for the best. It's for a good end, and so it's, it's, it'll be to the ultimate good, so I think I'll just cut the corner here. No, that's the pride of life. That's not the Word of God. So these are the things which motivate people to live down here. And you think about it, our specific holiness standards that we have, they come from specific passages of the Word of God. But there's a reason for them, not only just because they're of certain commands in certain places, but because they're trying to guard us against the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If you think about immodest dress, and jewelry, ornamentation, makeup, isn't that the problem that the Scripture is trying to deal with when it tells us to avoid these things? It's trying to guard us against the lust of the flesh that could be created against the lust of the eyes that could be stimulated against the pride of life that the wearer could develop. And when you look at the course of our society, you know, you just take one person dressing in a worldly fashion and maybe you can't see all these dangers being fulfilled in their life. But look at the course of our society as children grow up in a society that's becoming more and more immodest, that's gone further and further away from these principles. This century in particular, would you say that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is probably more fully in control than ever before in the history of our country? I think it would be fair to say. See, the Lord, His Word tries to guard us against these things. But when we break His Word and indulge in various things, we only feed the flesh. So, we need to choose. Are we going to look up and get our direction from the Lord? If so, that will motivate us to holiness. Or are we going to look around and see the things of this world? If so, that will motivate us to sin. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. If you make your choice to look around at this world and follow this world, you better realize it's only going to last for a short time. Whatever enjoyment you get in that lust or in that pride, you better live it up because pretty soon that's all there's going to be. 
But if you'll realize that those who do the Word of God and the will of God are going to abide forever. If you will just look beyond the circumstances of this life and the lusts of this world, if you will look up and you will realize that Jesus Christ reigns in glory, He's not limited to this world, but He inhabits eternity. So if you make Him the Lord of your life, you will live with Him eternally. You will share in that eternal glory. That is so far greater than anything this world has to offer. Look up. Fall in love. And that heavenly hope will motivate you to live for God right now. It motivates us to faith. It motivates us to love. And it motivates us to holiness. Let's look briefly at Colossians 3, continuing on. Verse 5, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. To mortify means to kill. And it's in the present tense. Keep on killing the members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 5 deals with various aspects of lust. Draws an ever-increasing circle, it seems to me. There's fornication, sexual immorality. There's uncleanness, which covers all kinds of of immorality. Even Romans 1, the term is used for homosexuality. And then there's inordinate affection, unlawful or uh, unusually strong and inappropriate desires and loves. And again, there's a connotation of sexual immorality, but it's a more broader term than that. And then it says uh, evil concupiscence, evil lusts, evil desires which again is even broader. And finally, it works out to covetousness or greed. You see, if you allow your flesh to have control in one area of life, it will try to assert control in another area of life. If you are not temperate, if you are not moderate, if you do not exert self-control in all areas of life, and you give the flesh control in one area, it's going to try to reach for control in another area. It may start with a specific form of lust or a specific form of immoral action, but it doesn't stop there. It draws an ever-increasing circle. And even greed, even the desire for possessions, for money, for things of others, is all a reflection of an immoral spirit. It can all work together. And actually, greed, in its ultimate sense, is the worship of material things. Idolatry. Maybe we don't worship Buddha. Maybe we don't bow down to a statue. But if we let our lives be dominated by material things, we're idolaters. At least that's what the Bible says. If I as a preacher decide, quote, the will of God based primarily on financial considerations, there's a question is who my God really is. Isn't that right? What this is saying, verse 5, let me just read on down. For which sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these. And so if we are going to look up and set our affections on the things above, if we're going to look to where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God, where He rules and reigns in glory, then we need to put off the old way of life. That's what He's saying. If you're going to follow Jesus, put off the old way of life. Put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Now in this list, anger is not sin. Ephesians 5 tells us to be angry, but not to sin. But it can be very close to sin, which is why it's stated this way. Because anger as an instinctive reaction to wrong is an emotion that can be used for constructive means or destructive means. But we have to be very close, careful. When we come angry at a situation, we must get control of that and not allow that anger to motivate us to lash out against someone in word or in deed, because that can become sinful. Or not to let it fester and become a grudge, develop into bitterness, hatred, jealousy, envy, strife. That also would be sinful. And so the only solution for anger is to recognize the source, decide to do something about it, but put away the anger itself. And these other things, wrath, a violent rage, malice, an ill will toward others, a desire to see others suffer, blasphemy, evil speech, particularly against God, 
filthy communication, obscene language. These things are sinful. We should put them away. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. We shouldn't lie to anyone, but especially in the church. We ought to have an expectation that our brother is telling us the truth. Don't lie to one another. Put off the old man. That's what he's saying. Get rid of the old way of life. This is the way you used to live before you met Christ. This is not the way you should live after you've met Christ. You need to look up and look to Him and realize that you need to put off the things of this world. Because you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You see, God has created you as a new creation. We become new creatures or new creation in Christ Jesus. So when you look to the Lord, you've been created anew in his holy image. The Lord is not bound to earth. The Lord is not sinful. The Lord is not limited to this world. You have been recreated in His image. So therefore, you should not live in sin. You should not live according to this world. But you should live like He lived. You should follow Him. You should look to Him. That's what the Scripture says. When you look to Jesus, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, neither the Greek culture, that was the prevailing culture of the Roman Empire, the world in which Paul wrote. And then there was the Jewish culture in which he lived. But in Christ, that's what I was preaching about a little while ago, in Christ, culture shouldn't divide us, whether you're Gentile or Jew. Circumcision, uncircumcision, religious heritage shouldn't divide us. The Jews took pride in their circumcision, their religious heritage, their law-keeping, but we shouldn't let those things divide us. Barbarian, that was the Greek term for everybody that was outside the realm of Greek culture. The Scythian, those were the most barbaric form of barbarians. The very cruel tribes that lived in the area around southern Russia, Ukraine, around the Black Sea. In other words, even the people that you would think of as the remote pagans in Christ. None of these distinctions matter. If they come in Christ, you should not despise them for being from a primitive culture according to your standards. You need to put off the old way of thinking. Put on the new. In Christ, there is neither bond nor free. Get rid of social and class standing when you come to the Lord. There should be no honor given to rich people and then uh, ignoring those who aren't so rich. If we are going to laud somebody that comes just because he holds some high position or is some wealthy individual, we ought to give equal attention to any other visitor that comes. They all need God. We ought to recognize them all. We shouldn't play up to one just because we think he can give the church a great benefit. Go ahead and honor him. Give honor to whom honor is due. That's fine. But you also better love those that come that don't seem to have anything worthy of honor. In Christ... We've got to put off the worldly way of thinking. And then verse 12 says, put on. Not only do we put off the old life, but we put on the new life. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Hey, do you realize that we are the elect, the chosen, the handpicked of God? The holy ones. When God looks at us, He does not see our sinful past. He does not see our imperfections in our personality. He does not see the sinful nature that lies within us. But He sees that if that the Holy Spirit is in control, He sees the holiness and righteousness of Christ in our lives. We are holy in God's sight. We are beloved. Those terms were once used for the chosen nation of Israel. But now, they're used for you and me. The elect, the holy, the beloved. Since that's who we are, we ought to put on vows of mercy. That's compassion. We need to be compassionate. We need to be kind. We need to be humble. We need to be meek. We need to be long-suffering. That's patient, but I like the word long-suffering. It puts it very literally. Sometimes we have to suffer a long time. You know, we in America are oriented toward our rights. I got my rights. But sometimes, for the sake of Christ, we surrender our rights. Even though 
Christians. We don't deserve for someone to persecute us or mistreat us, especially not in the church, but for the sake of peace, for the sake of love, for the sake of trying to restore that person. Sometimes we suffer through a situation and let God bring the resolution and the victory. We don't demand our rights, but we look up to the Lord and say, Lord, you take care of it in your way, in your time. I surrender my rights to you. You see, I don't really want what I deserve. I don't want to insist on my rights, because if that's all I get, I'm probably going to be in big trouble. But I'd rather trust the mercy of God. And therefore, if I'm going to trust the mercy of God, I've got to be willing to extend mercy to others. Leave it in the hands of the Lord. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. I talked about this a while ago. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. We've got to have a spirit of forgiveness. Sometimes it's hard to do. But that's why we need to go pray until the animosity and the bitterness is cleansed from us. And we can look at that person who has wronged us and sincerely have no hatred in our heart towards them. Be ready to forgive them. Even approach them with an offer of reconciliation. And if they rebuff that, we're still patiently ready when the time comes to renew a relationship. That's how Jesus treated us, right? Did He wait for you to repent before He died at Calvary? No. He died when you hated Him. He offered forgiveness when you were still living in sin. And when you turned Him aside, He was still there waiting. When you said, no, I want no part of it, he was, His sacrifice was still available to you, just waiting for you to claim it. That's the kind of forgiveness we must learn to show towards others. It's forgiveness that suffers for others' wrongs. Jesus Christ died so that we don't have to die. He didn't say, I forgive you, but you've got to suffer. You've got to bear the price. But He bore it for us. When we forgive, bygones have to be bygones. We don't go back and try to exact a pound of flesh from that person that we've forgiven. No, we, we suffer the consequences of their fault. And we say, let's just forget it. What I suffered, what it cost me, I'll just bear that in order that we can start afresh right now. That's what Jesus did, right? That's what we need to learn to do. Look up and follow Him. And above all these things, put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness. You're not dressed properly unless you put on love. To complete your ensemble, above all the rest, put on that cloak that garment of love which brings everything else together. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Peace in the body, thankfulness to God. When it says let the peace of God rule, it means like an umpire. Let peace call the shots. If there's a judgment call, if you're wondering what to do, let peace make the decision. If you're trying to decide, should I insist on my rights? Should I get back at that brother? Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I set the record straight? Ask yourself, what would peace say? To bring unity in the body, what decision would be appropriate? Let peace be the umpire in your hearts. Praise God. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What beautiful treasures in this verse. Loving the truth. Seeking divine wisdom. Teaching and admonishing one another in worship. One of the functions of worship is to teach and exhort and encourage each other. Here's what we ought to live like. Love. Peace. Peace thankfulness, attention to the Word of God, seeking the wisdom of God, praise and worship to God. When you look up, you'll see a new way of life. Put off the old. Put on the new. When we look up, we'll be motivated to holiness. Going back to verse 3 and 4. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear 
with Him in glory. Let me tell you something. If you look up to the Lord right now, if you're motivated by that heavenly hope, it will cause you to walk by faith every day and not by sight. It will cause you to love one another, even though some people may seem to act toward you in an unloving manner. It will cause you to walk in holiness, even though the world around you would try to deflect you from that course. And during that time of walking by faith, walking in love, walking in holiness, your true life is hidden from the world. It may seem like a very foolish path that you've chosen, at least as far as the flesh is concerned, at least as far as the carnal mind is concerned. But I want you to realize we do have that heavenly hope. This is not the end. The way you're living now, the way you're walking now, the way you're battling Satan now, that's not the end result. But the end result is this, Christ who is our life, is going to one day appear back in this world. He's going to interrupt the order of earthly things. He's going to intervene from the glory world into this world. And you know the beautiful thing about it is, when Christ comes back to earth to establish His kingdom on earth, guess who's coming with Him? The saints of God will return with Him in glory. You are going to appear in the glory of God if you will walk by faith right now, if you will live in love right now, if you will follow the path of holiness, if you will look up to Jesus, if you will cherish that heavenly hope, then one day that hope will be realized. It will be actualized. All of your unsaved loved ones and friends, well, their theories will all be cast down. The people of this world that have fought against you, the world system that's a the church. One day, all of that will crumble, and the whole world will look up in awe as Jesus Christ, our Lord, appears, and the world will further look in awe as we appear with Him in glory. Praise God. Hallelujah. Heavenly glory awaits us if we'll keep looking up in love, if we'll fall in love with Jesus, if we'll follow Him, then one day we will reign with Him in glory. One day we will be manifested for who we really are, the sons of God. Hallelujah. It doesn't even yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Oh, hallelujah. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. And now you see through a glass darkly. But one day you'll see Him face to face. If you keep looking up, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, one day you'll see Him clearly. One day you'll see Him as He is. One day the heavenly glory will be revealed in our lives in this earth. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. There's a heavenly glory that awaits us. Oh, it's real. It's fantastic. It's something the world can't offer. Praise God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, when He's revealed, when He makes His dramatic re-entry into this atmosphere, we shall appear with Him in glory. Oh, hallelujah. What a hope. What a hope. It ought to motivate us to have faith. It ought to motivate us to love. It ought to motivate us to holiness. Oh, hallelujah. It's a sure hope. It's a certain hope. It's the glory of God that awaits us. Oh, hallelujah. I can't wait to see Him in glory. I can't wait to be glorified with Him. I can't wait to be like Him. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Our heavenly hope will ultimately transform itself into heavenly glory. Praise God. And so... In conclusion, verse 17, And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now we love to use this to say you ought to be baptized in Jesus' name because it's both word and deed. And that's true. Whenever there is a time to invoke the name of God, this verse tells us what name we're talking about. When we call in the name of Jesus, we're not denying the Father. We're giving glory to the Father because it's the Father Himself who chose that name by which to reveal Himself to this world. And so it would be ridiculous to try to cast out demons and never mention the name of Jesus. Who would want to do that? I don't think even Trinitarians want to try that. It would be crazy to try pray the prayer of healing and never mention the name of Jesus. 
It would be foolish any time where it's necessary to invoke the name of God, the authority and power of God. It would be foolish not to even think about or mention the name that's above every name, the only name given for our salvation, the name of Jesus. But this verse has more application than just to select times when we're expected to call God's name. It says, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of Jesus. I don't think that means that when you get up in the morning and you brush your teeth, you say, I'm now brushing my teeth in the name of Jesus. And you put on your clothes, you say, now I'm getting dressed in the name of Jesus. I'm now eating breakfast in the name of Jesus. I don't think you have to say that, but I think there is a profound truth. Whatever you do, you should do it in a manner consistent with the invocation of His name. Whatever you do today, can you do it in a way that says, Lord, put your blessing upon what I'm doing today. Whatever you do, do it in a manner that's consistent with the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When you have a disagreement with someone... And maybe it's a legitimate disagreement. Maybe it's something that needs to be said. Something that needs to be corrected. But before you say those words that you're getting ready to say, think, can I invoke the name of Jesus upon these words? Can I do say this in a manner that's consistent with the Lordship of Jesus in my life? If there's some words that you're contemplating that aren't consistent with the Lordship of Jesus, swallow those. And then go ahead and say what needs to be said. But do it. In the name of Jesus. Whatever you say, whatever you do, do it in a manner that would be consistent with the Lordship of Jesus over your life. In other words, before you take that hasty action, before you say those irrevocable words, look up. Look at Jesus. Think about Him for a moment. Think about His Lordship over your life. And then, go ahead and say, and do what needs to be done in the situation. There are times to deal with unpleasant situations, but even in those cases, we need to do it keeping at least one eye looking up. Praise God. Keep looking up. Look up in love and draw your motivation from the heavenly glory that awaits you. Praise God. Let's stand right now. Praise God. And I want you to think about this right now. Some of you may be in trial. Some of you may need direction for your life. Some of you may have been attacked by the devil, by unsaved people, or maybe somebody in the church that's trying to deflect you from the way of truth and holiness. There may be discouragement in your life, but I want you to realize that right now, if you'll look to Jesus, if you'll turn your eyes upon Jesus, everything else will fade away, will pale into insignificance. Keep looking up. Look up in love. And you see that you have an eternal glory awaiting you. And soon it will be manifested. You know, it would be a good idea every once in a while to look up. Every few days, every few hours, whenever you get troubled by the things of this world, whenever you get sidetracked, whenever you get a little bit confused, a little bit discouraged, look up. It wouldn't be a bad idea to do that, not only spiritually, but even physically. You ever just look, maybe at sunrise or sunset, maybe on a cloudy day, and you saw the awesome glory of God in creation, and then have you ever just watched that a while and said, just what if suddenly that cloud would part? And while I was actually watching, Jesus would appear. You know, just what if, while I'm enjoying the, the sunset, behind the mountains. What if suddenly there was a light that outshone the sun? And what if today was the day? You know, that'll change the way you live. If you just take a moment, actually, to physically look up every once in a while, it might just affect what we did the rest of that day. I say right now, today, why don't we look to Jesus? Why don't we look to Him? Let's draw new strength from Him. Look up in love and receive what the Lord has for you today. Look up in love and get that motivation 
to have faith right now. Look up and get that motivation to have love right now. Look up and get the motivation to walk in holiness right now. Look up, I say, and see the glory of God that awaits you. Look up and see that your Lord reigns in glory. Jesus is on the right hand of God. He has all glory, all power, all authority. Why don't you look up right now? That glory is soon to be revealed. He is coming soon. Our Lord is soon to come and glorify us with Him. Let's look up right now. Let's worship Him. Let's praise Him. Let's exalt Him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God.